Welcome back to Queensland Votes. This is our final episode before the 2020 Queensland election on Saturday the 31st of October. And here to tell us what to expect is Professor of Politics at Griffith University, Peter Van Onselen. Election day is this Saturday for voters in Queensland and it will be interesting to see if this result reflects the polls which are limited that we've seen suggesting that the LNP will be defeated. It will be their third defeat since 2012 and could bring into doubt whether or not the union between the Nationals and the Liberals will continue on the other side of the election. In terms of federal implications, it'll also be interesting with the level of border discussions dominating the polling. Maybe that's a precursor to what we're going to see over in WA when Mark McGowan, as the incumbent Premier, goes to the people in February. There's also, of course, the issue of the number of marginal seats at this election, over 30 on margins of under 5%. That means that election night could be tougher to predict with various votes coming in during the course of the evening. It also means that even though Labor in the box seat, according to the polls, they may well lose their majority and be forced to govern as a minority government in the aftermath. And let's not forget as well, more than a million postal and pre-poll votes have already been issued. That's a record number for the state of Queensland, and that could also create a scenario where it's harder and harder to pick the result on the night. I'll be watching on the Saturday evening. Make sure you do the same. Thank you so much, Peter. And now to introduce the amazing couch of Queensland politics experts, we have Dr Paul Williams joining us. We have Dr Tracy Arclay from the School of Governance and International Relations. And we have our own Jenny Menzies, who is Principal Research Fellow at the Policy Innovation Hub. Welcome. OK, so just reflecting on what Peter's just told us, what do you think? Well, that's certainly the feeling on the ground, um, having to talk, talk to both with Labor folk and LNP folk. And, uh, you know, I've done the cab driver test like everyone else. And really, the default position is that there's no appetite for change at the moment. Uh, and I've talked to people in North Queensland. And even though things like law and order are bubbling along at the surface, again, there doesn't seem much appetite for change. Uh, and this is very, I think, uh, indicative of what we saw of the 2020 Brisbane City Council election uh, in, uh, in March. Again, despite Labor having the, the candidate from Central Casting, uh, Labor couldn't make a dent on the LNP mayoralty or ward vote. And I'm, I'm just not seeing uh, a mood for change uh, today in the same way I didn't see a mood for change in March in Brisbane in 2020. Um, having said that, uh, the opposition leader, Deb Freckleton, has had a stellar close to the campaign. Uh, you might say that she actually won the third week. Uh, it's too early to tell, you know, I think it's probably neck and neck in the last week as we head to, to, to polling day itself. And the, the, the problem with this election, of course, is that the primary votes are locked in at 37% each. And I think that the after preference vote that the major polling agencies are attributing, 52 to 40, 48 in Labor's favour, is quite an elastic number. And we know that we have what, what I'm calling the washing machine of preferences. We've got uh, so many moving parts, particularly in North Queensland, then that result could easily be reversed. It could actually be 52, 48 uh, to the LNP's favour. So this election is very uncertain. I've been watching and working in Queensland elections very closely for 37 years, and this is the toughest election I've ever had to call. Uh, it is uh, remarkably close, and more to the point, I mean, some of the, some of the ultra-marginal seats might not change hands. No one should be at all surprised if seats like Townsville and Gavin is not lost, despite them being under one percentage point. And yet we might see seats like um, uh, uh, seats that, like Chatsworth in Brisbane, uh, which is um, held by about three percentage points by the LNP. That's under threat, and we know that because Deb Breckingston was campaigning assiduously here. Uh, this is a, this, this election might throw out some surprises yet. I think it probably will. The washing machine of preferences, I like that. What do you think, Tracy? Are you confident in any kind of call at this point? Oh, no, no, not at all. I think I think that the old adage of who do you trust to manage the economy has been replaced this time by who do you trust to manage the pandemic. And I think that probably favours the ALP, but with a record number of candidates standing, preferences could go anywhere, a number of tight seats, and Queensland being so different across the different regions, it's going to be a really tough one to predict, and I'm not, I'm not going to call it for either at this stage. I can't even figure out what's happening in Mansfield, my own seat, so there you go. Now, Jenny, to you, what do you think? Oh, yeah, I agree with all of those comments. I think... Um, the pandemic, a crisis like that, has a really stabilising impact, so that uh, will benefit the incumbent Labor government. What really, what normally happens in elections where you have high unemployment um, and a recession is that the incumbent, incumbent government loses, even if it's not their fault. So it's just right. research has been done into that. Whereas I think this election, as Tracy said, 
That, I, I think uh, that's unlikely to happen and that the pandemic, the management of the pandemic will um, support Anastasia Palaszczuk, but it is going to be very tight. I think the seats will be spraying everywhere. Um, there's different campaigns being run in different parts of the state. So it's very hard to get a grip on it. And as Paul said, I think there will be surprises on the night. Yeah, well, there you go. Washing machine of preferences, seats spraying everywhere. What a Saturday night it's going to be. So now let's just focus on some of the far north Queensland seats. Uh, Paul, what's your thinking about the potential gains and losses in far north Queensland and the reasons why? Well, it's again, it's in incredibly difficult to predict, but clearly if you look at the pendulums on simple basis of arithmetic, uh, seats like Townsville, uh, Mundingburra, the two of the three Townsville seats, they're ultra marginal. They are under 1.1%, both of those. And uh, because law and order already is an issue bubbling along, because those sorts of regional seats or have already faced um, economic uh, problems. Uh, youth unemployment tends to be higher on those sorts of seats. So there, it's, it's, Labor's really would really normally be struggling under normal circumstances in those seats. And we saw that obviously in seats like Herbert uh, at the last federal election. Uh, but having said that, then those sorts of seats, because they're a long way from the border, they tend to have a, a, a disproportionate number of older voters who may be very grateful that Anastasia Palaszczuk has uh, quote unquote, kept Queensland safe from the pandemic bullet. It's not a state decision to close international travel borders. That's a federal decision. So, you know, that's a lot of the tourism up there is international, right? Oh, indeed. That's right. International tourism is very much a Scott Morrison decision. Uh, but, the, the, you know, the, the, the memes that have come around this and, you know, we've seen them, you know, uh, protests on the Gold Coast in Brisbane is that it's Anastasia Palaszczuk's fault. She's a heartless premier, etc. So that may resonate. But I suspect that there is a quite a significant silent majority, what I call the, who are going to express what I call the gratitude vote, grateful that Queensland has not morphed into Victoria. Uh, and despite things like long-term joblessness, long-term youth joblessness, uh, 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 other problems with the economy, a sense of Brisbane uh, perhaps dictating to Townsville, not building enough infrastructure, there may well be a swing against the LNP in seats like Townsville, Mundingborough, uh, Cook, uh, Cairns, Barron River. Again, it's, it's speculation, but that potential is always there. OK, thank you so much. I'm going to come to Jenny now. Uh, this idea of the gratitude vote, what do you think about that? And also, I felt like the leaders have practically ignored Brisbane <laughs> uh, this campaign. Was that wise? Is that necessary to get the kind of results they need to get in uh, you know, the more regional seats? I, I, yes, I, I think there is a gratitude vote, and I think where it will be tricky for the LNP is that it could well be... Brisbane Liberals, who will be expressing their vote for stability through that gratitude vote. Because the LNP didn't kind of cover themselves in glory with calling for the opening prematurely, I think, of the borders. Okay. Look, it's interesting. I had a look at, at where um, the leaders had been, and they hadn't been to Brisbane uh, very often at all, very few seats. So it's going to be Gold Coast, back to Townsville, Gold Coast, Townsville, stop off at Pummerstone and Rocky or something on the way through. So that indicates to me through their tracking polling that that's stable because they would be all over those seats um, if they thought there was a, was a danger. So that also brings into play some of the Greens' claims about the seats that they think they might be winning in Brisbane. Uh, I don't think that's reflected... Uh, particularly in where the Premier has been visiting. OK, interesting. So, Tracy, take us through what you think about some of these seats that you're most interested in on the night, and have we missed any? Uh, I think our seats are the ones that we identified right at the beginning. I think that still holds, but, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out. You know, Cairns and perhaps seats like um, Whitsunday, Sunday, Jason Costigan currently you know, holds that, but, you know, the LNP might get that back. Cairns, it's going to depend on how angry they were about the border closures and how affected they are. Townsville and, um, and you know, Thurngawa, they were one last time on, ALP, on LNP preferences. This time that's not going to happen. I think that could be interesting to see where those preferences go. Um, Palmerstone, you know, very, very marginal. I think ALP are quite confident about that one. So, look, I think, I think it's going to be a really interesting night. 
right? Back in Brisbane, you know, seats like Clayfield, will the ALP benefit from having a really strong Greens candidate in Andrew Bartlett there who can direct preferences to the ALP? Is Tim Nichols, a former LNP leader, going to be in jeopardy there? Who knows? Mogul, the Greens are running a campaign to make Mogul marginal. And, you know, and at 5%, you know, that's an interesting campaign, you know, slogan. Um, I think I think it's going to be an interesting night. I think, you know, it's going to all very much depend on where preferences end up sitting. And at this stage, it's hard to know where exactly which seat's going to be affected by that. I mean, even whether people will be able to use how to vote cards in the same way or whether they're getting how to vote information, how they're going to direct their preferences. Uh, if I can come to you, Paul, are there any minority parties that you think are going to do well in this particular election that you think might do better than, not, than you would have expected because of the particular spread of minority parties this time? Well, the received wisdom is in crisis elections or um, what we call big policy or big ticket single issue elections, minor parties tend to get squeezed out. Um, and really, this is both a single issue election and a crisis election. So it's almost like a perfect storm for the minor parties to do badly and the major parties to do well. It's almost as if uh, you know Queenslanders are looking at this and saying, well, you know, we really do have a problem. Um, we can't flirt. We can't go to the protest parties anymore. Uh, we need the grown ups to look after this problem. We can't we can't waste our vote. So we've long expected that parties like One Nation would be down. And that's been compounded by the fact that Pauline Hanson has been almost invisible in this campaign. So her vote will be down significantly. Um, the Catter Party vote may be down, but if it is down, it's probably going to be down only a slight amount because we know that the Catter Party vote is concentrated and we know that the Catters work better at grassroots level. Uh, so that prop, that vote probably won't be down and they'll probably hold those three seats. One Nation may actually lose Mirani. We just don't know. It just depends on who finishes third, fourth, et cetera. But it's certainly under threat. Um, and what are you, and, and they've been going very heavily with Anna Palmer, haven't they, which is an unusual... Well, uh, uh, Anna Palmer you... might... You know, I, I think the, the, the only conclusion to draw there is that the UAP campaign strategists have decided that Anna Palmer is the acceptable face of, of UAP. Um, but look, the, the the death tax scare campaign has attracted so much opprobrium and so much negative publicity, it may have in fact cancelled out the effect. Um, and it's almost become a cultural meme in itself. Um, you know, Clive's at it again. Yeah. Um, and look, and given that it's a, it's just a replication of what we saw during the 2019 election, it's almost like, you know, uh, fool, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on you. Uh, it's it's not going to have the same resonance that it had in 2019. For the federal election too, he could back that up with the franking credits. You know, the franking credits were a policy, so therefore it wasn't too big a jump. This time around, it's kind of like, you know, pulling out a, a trick from a, a very old tired hat. And, um, yes. you know, but boy, have they been spending some money on that campaign. It's just yeah, remarkable. 4.6 million. A lot of money, but not on, not on policy. 4.6 <laughs> million on, on being a spoiler. It's yeah. fascinating. Having said that, the the only party that the only minor party that, that will do well are the Greens, uh, and that's for very different reasons. Um, if they hadn't, it, for one, there's still a lot of anti-coal um, uh, anger in the southeast, and that will keep boosting their vote. They're very, you know, green hardcore Greens voters are still very angry at the Palaszczuk government over the final Adani tick. Uh, and secondly, it, the way that the Greens have campaigned, um, Palmer, Hanson, and Catter are. Uh, what we call caucus cater parties. They're, you know, they 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 have a very um, top-heavy structure. They're structured around a titular leader and a personality, and not much of a grassroots structure. Uh, and uh, but whereas the Greens are very much a grassroots party, and they have been campaigning assiduously in the seats. They've been door knocking, except for a short break during the worst of COVID. But they've been door knocking very carefully throughout all of this. Uh, and so they so the Green votes in the post-material seats in in inner and middle Brisbane. Everywhere from McConnell, South Brisbane, Maywa, and Green Slopes, for example, and, and and possibly Cooper, will really hold up. Yeah, actually, coming to you, Jenny. I mean, this uh, I've ever seen strong Greens activity in the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast, um, and and definitely in Green Slopes, very very visible. So, what do you think? Is Labor really uh, getting a challenge? Will they receive the benefit of this strong Greens campaign? The Greens also have some internal strife. Of They've all had internal strife, haven't they? Every, all of them. Uh, what do you think will happen with the with the Greens ALP? It, uh, it's always hard to tell with the Greens. Um, they always talk up a big story and quite often it doesn't come to fruition. Right. So at the last state election they had South Brisbane in the bag. No, none of them mentioned May Maywa. So I suspect they mightn't have the financial 
clout to do the detailed tracking polling that would actually give um, a party like that a, a, a sense. They do do all of the on the ground stuff, as Paul said. They're, they're out everywhere. There is, I think, there's a bit of trickiness with um, getting the Greens vote up this time, particularly in places like South Brisbane, because they're reliant on LNP voters following the how to vote card. Um, and voting for the Greens before Labor. I think some of the Brisbane Liberals might balk at that and go, um, do we really want to elect what they might consider a radical Green candidate over a Labor candidate? So uh, it, it will come down to preferences and the discipline around following their how to vote card. Jenny, I think you're quite right. And re really but that's what makes it more problematic is that um, with each passing election, fewer and fewer Australians are following how to vote cards. Uh, we're becoming much more independent in our uh, preferences. Um, so it's so th th when when these parties make these preference decisions, um, it really doesn't offer any more light. Next up, we have Dr. Tony Matthews from the Cities Research Institute talking to us about urban planning challenges for whoever forms government. As the 2020 Queensland state election draws near, politicians on all sides are paying close attention to the impacts of COVID-19 on our cities and on our regions. Whoever forms government will have to grapple with a very serious policy question. Will COVID-19 fundamentally change our cities and our regions? Here are three issues that require firm policy responses from the next Queensland government. COVID-19 has fundamentally disrupted Queensland cities. Impacts from the pandemic are being felt in many ways with good and bad consequences. The trend towards working from home, for example, is a transformative change. Many companies are considering allowing CBD workers to work permanently from home. This will then reduce the size of their expensive city centre offices. It seems that many who live and work in CBDs no longer want or need to, as more companies opt for decentralised workforces. This trend has big implications for the next Queensland Government. There will be financial, social and environmental impacts established urban patterns may no longer hold. New urban policy responses will have to be innovative, flexible and dynamic. The classic problem is creating diverse employment opportunities in regional areas to attract residents from larger cities. Policy innovations in this space have a patchy history. The trend towards working from home may have inadvertently helped to solve this problem. Many people can now live in regional cities while working remotely for employers in larger cities. Many workers who are seeking a slower pace of life and more competitively priced property now have a great opportunity. It's likely that Queensland will see populations in regional cities surge with new arrivals coming from southeast Queensland and from interstate. This is a unique possibility for the Queensland State Government to grow regions and stimulate new economies. New policy innovations should focus on quickly delivering quality housing and social infrastructure like schools and hospitals. It will not be enough just to plan for growth in regional cities. It is imperative now to plan well, plan strategically and plan for the long term. The shifting dynamics of urban populations and workforces over the coming years will challenge established policy, planning and development paradigms. New urban development projects will be needed in many regional cities. Conversely, Brisbane and Gold Coast may need to consider urban regeneration projects if high vacancies in urban residential and office space continue. The distribution of some planning and development powers between state and local governments may change to prioritise certain projects. Changes will need to be justified by economic, environmental or social objectives. Even if this approach is necessary, it may cause controversy, it may cause upheaval and certainly could cause legal challenges. It will definitely not be business as usual for the new Queensland State Government. Experiences from the pandemic mean that urban planning and policy priorities are set for transformative change. The new Queensland State Government will need to be strategic, diplomatic and brave to maximise future opportunities for all Queensland cities. I'm joined today by our expert from the School of Governance and International Relations, Dr. Ferran Martina de Goma, who is a senior lecturer in politics. And he is going to talk to us about the impact of voting in a pandemic and what it means for the Queensland state election. So talk us through what impact it's had so far, these high, high levels of pre-polling votes. To get an idea, uh, we as a state in Queensland for the local elections, the numbers were skyrocketed on, on, on the local elections in March, and now the numbers are even, even higher, right? Now, this is 
pretty surprising. I mean, it makes sense on the one hand, given the amount of effort that the ACQ is given, right, and all the facilities. Uh, you know, for, for example, ACQ has expanded the opening hours, also the opening days. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, it's kind of paradoxical because it made a, given in the situation we're in with the pandemic, Queensland so far, and thankfully, we've been doing quite a good job, right? So in a sense, we could expect that people would go and vote, and vote safely, right? However, even if we're, it's a paradoxical situation because we're in a safer situation than we were in March, but the numbers are, right now, it's, you know, we have no records yet. It's, it's the highest that ever been. So it is, it is quite paradoxical. And the other thing to say is that the Queensland situation is not unique. Uh, the good news again is we have it easy in order to vote. So, uh, you know, you just want to show up and, and care to your ballot early. That's, that's great. But in other countries, like, you know, in, in the US, for instance, I was looking at some, up some numbers. And, you know, just to give you an idea, I think it's North Carolina. In the 2016 election, just in the state of, of North Carolina, which they're voting actually after us, right? Uh, they only had 25,000 early votes. This year alone, as of yesterday, was 204,000. So the AAP this week has reported some really high turnouts in particularly marginal seats. Uh, but then some very low turnouts in other uh, still very marginal seats. So what is the explanation for this variation in the data? Those, those uh, seats in which uh, you, we observe higher proportion of early voting, as you were pointing out, they tend to be urban, urban, urban settings. Okay. With, you know, the district size, basically, the electoral division is much smaller than some others. So for instance, Condamine, as we were mentioning, it's over 5,000 square kilometers. Those, those seats with uh, higher turnout that we've observed tend to be smaller, so more urban concentration. Now, there, as you were pointing out, there, there are some seats that are limiting. So for instance, um, in Townsville, you have uh, Mundimbura, which is limiting with the other end. In one of them, you observe, as you were pointing out, over 30% of people have already voted, and in the other one is like not even 7%. So something is going on there. Now, though, more importantly, the question is how is this going to affect candidates and parties, right? Because, because they've barely been out of Townsville, right? I mean, the leaders have been there pretty much the whole time. Precisely. So now you have 35% of people say, imagine just for, for, for the sake of the example, that 35% of the people have already voted in all the, this, in all the seats up, up north. Hardliners tend to show, up, uh, to show up earlier. So, you know, if you are a liberal, labor supporter, whatever you are, you know, you've been with your party all your life. Well, you know, you probably do it earlier and, and that's it. So maybe it's those undeciders those people that are more undecided that we're waiting to see what they are doing, you know, maybe waiting for last minute promises that they'll that will help them to to to, to turn out the vote. Oh, thank you so much, Farhan. Finally, some good news for 2020. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> thank you, Sue. Thank you all. If we have almost half of Queenslanders, nearly a million Queenslanders have already voted by now. It's the it's an absolute historical record uh, in terms of people turning out early. What does that mean for the way the parties have structured their campaigns for this election, and what does it mean for elections to come? Turning first to Jenny, please. It's it's interesting. I've been thinking about this for a while because it is a longer term trend. I mean, it happened last federal election. I think it happened last state election, and I've been surprised by how slowly um, the major parties have have been to change the way they, they campaign. So really the only compromise they made this time was they uh, brought their campaign launches into week two instead of week three. A, a lot of people had voted by then. Um, and they've, they both parties, major parties have stuck to, and I can understand why, but not releasing their costings until the, the final week of the campaign. Um, they both went out with some big ticket items early, big infrastructure items. But really beyond that, it's been campaigning um, as usual. And I'm surprised that they've taken so long to actually recalibrate the way that they do it. 
I mean, for me, you kind of expect that COVID might affect the way people turn out to vote, but it seems a bit counterintuitive if you're standing in a long, long line to avoid any COVID issues on election day. It doesn't make sense. So it can't all be COVID-driven, surely, this trend. So coming to you, Tracy, what do you think? Do you think the parties have been a bit slow to I think manoeuvre? they've known now for a very long time that the election was going to be held on the 31st of October. And every, now, every year now, they're going to know that in four years' time, the last Last Saturday of October, there's going to be an election. So I don't think there's any excuse anymore for why they can't bring forward their costings, bring forward all their policies so that, it's, so that Queenslanders really do have the opportunity to think about it, understand how things are going to be paid for, how the promises are going to be met. And, and really have a have a have time to think about that. In a democracy, that's I think the minimum that we can expect from the two parties vying to be the government. Mm, great. Coming to you now, Paul, what do you think? What what's going on with this uh, sort of nineteen nineties campaign style, but a twenty twenty uh, electorate? This election it was so front loaded that we saw some of the biggest policies announced even before the writs were issued. Uh, and I think we're going to see more of the same. And I think Tracy's point is right, that there is no excuse now that we can't have costings early in the piece. But of course, the parties will continue to do that because they just want to avoid media scrutiny. So what I think we've, we've seen, one thing I haven't really seen, I thought we'd see twin peaks. Uh, obviously, we'd see a spike at the beginning where we saw uh, some major announcements, and then there would be a lull. And then we'd have some uh, a peak in the last week where we to pick up the, the voters who are most apathetic. Clearly, those who are most enthused about this election, they vote pre-poll. You saw queues on the very first Monday of pre-polling. And clearly, those people who don't really care about election there, and there would be some people in Queensland now who still don't know there is an election on the 31st of October. <laughs> so the, camp, the party's mission now is to bring those people to the polls. Um, but so what I haven't seen this late in the campaign is I was, I'm still waiting for the second peak. It, it has tapered off rather than ended in a second explosion, which I think is surprising. I might be even more cynical about this, but I suspect lots of people voted early so that they could then completely switch off from any mentions of election campaigns. OK, so now we're going to move to the vexed issue of uh, if the LNP do lose, as we've, we've heard from Peter Van Onselen, uh, what's going to happen? We know that Deb Frecklington faces consequences probably if she loses this election, but will there be a deeper split between the LNP, between the Liberals and the National Party? We have such a unique arrangement in this state. We've seen in the ACT all kinds of you know, going to the Hall of Mirrors for a good hard look at yourself for the ACT Liberals after that last election, a long time in the wilderness. If they lose this election in Queensland, it will similarly be a long time in the wilderness. What might happen? Turning to our couch, I'll come to Tracy first. What do you think about the LNP? What will happen? In terms of a demerger, and I always, when you talk about demergers, I actually say split. Um, if you go historically, that never works well. It didn't work for the DLP when they split from the ALP. It kept both in the wilderness for a long time. I understand why some nationals would be thinking this isn't helping our brand, being so tightly linked to the, to the Liberal Party. But realistically, if you look at what happens in New South Wales, where the nationals still are an independent party, they're separate from the Liberals, they've got real competition against the shooters and fishers. Up in Queensland, the old national brand is sort of being, you know, taken over by parties like the Catters Australia Party. Both Shooters and Fishers in New South Wales, Catter Australia Party here are more national than the nationals are now. It's a real dilemma for them. I don't think um, splitting from the LNP is going to help them, really. I think, you know, it's bad times ahead for the National Party everywhere. But, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what pressure, you know, mounts to see whether they do actually break away. Mm, interesting. Um, I'll come to you now. Jenny, what do you think about this whole issue of what will happen to the LNP should they lose? Well, they'll certainly have to have a good hard look at themselves because it has shown that they've been reasonably unelectable in Queensland over a 30-year period. And that's that's kind of, you know, <laughs> getting in there with Labor's long period in the wilderness from the 50s to the 80s. Um, so there obviously needs to be a review and a rethinking. I think uh, the LNP have to think about, well, are their differences irreconcilable? Um, and, um, you know, what is keeping them together? So it's a bit of a going back to a basics thing, like, you know, what do we gain by being together? And it's all a bit complicated because I'm not really sure what that conflict with the administrative wing is about as well. So that will obviously play out very quickly after the election if Deb Frecklington 
uh, losers and I believe the administrative wing have a preferred candidate. So I think it's going to get very messy and very ugly uh, very quickly for them. Well, I mean, Paul, uh, the, uh, all the newspapers were saying this week that the LNP raised twice as much money for this campaign as the ALP. It's not obvious to look at that they're outspending the ALP two to one in terms of impact, I would have thought. So they're, they're clearly fundraising OK. What's going wrong? What's happening? Yeah. Yeah, look, I was I was also surprised at that the level of funding that the the the, uh, the opposition's attracted, particularly given the again the groundswell of opinion that the opposition's not going to be re-elected, that the opposition won't be elected. Um, look, clearly, I don't think it's, it's any secret that Deb Frackington is a drag on the LNP vote, um, and um, they're, they're doing this terrible paradox where the where Deb Frackington is extremely popular in her party room, but virtually nowhere else in Queensland. Uh, she's not even got traction in North Queensland. Um, and this speaks to the dilemma as to where the party is going to go post-election. On the one hand, there's a strong argument, historical argument, that if the LNP fails for a third time and they're looking down the barrel of four years of opposition, and this really sticks in the core of LNP MPs, if you speak to them, they don't want to be in opposition for four more years. Um, there's a, there is a sense that the parties would go their separate ways. However, it really is contingent upon the relation or the, the ratio of old tribal Nats to old tribal Liberals in the new LNP party room. At the moment, the old Nash, those who identify as old Nats from regional Queensland far outweigh those who identify as Libs. You've got about five in the greater Brisbane area and a contingent of the Gold Coast. Um, so far less than half. So in that sense, nationals don't necessarily want to see the LNP dis dissolve because uh, it's their party. They see it, they really have seen it as a national party. And they've got one of their own as leader. Deb Frankington is a farmer from Nanango. She's one of us. Um, it's the Libs who might actually pull the pin on the merger uh, because they're sick of coming second. But again, it's really contingent on federal intervention. I mean, that you know, we remember back when the LNP wanted to form, John Howard said, "No, you're not going to have, you're not going to merge the Liberals and the Nationals," and that was a major sticking point. It may come down to the fact that Scott Morrison might um, veto this idea. The federal secretariat, the federal executive, might veto the idea as well. So. Three years ago, I was convinced that the LNP would dissolve at some point. Today, I'm not so sure. It might hang around for the much longer term. Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting. It should favour different types of campaigning around Queensland. The Queensland election is a history-making one. For just the second time in a state campaign, two women are going head to head. Does this mean that gender equality issues are finally writ large across the election campaign, though? Sadly, neither Labor's Anastasia Palaszczuk nor Liberal National Party's Deb Frecklington appear to be interested in highlighting the needs and perspectives of women ahead of Election Day. Just because both leaders are women does not mean that women's issues or even a focus on female perspectives is featuring on the campaign trail. COVID-19 has hurt women's work and has led to the so-called pink recession. Women are more likely to be in part-time, casual or insecure work and to work in industries most affected by lockdowns and economic turndown, such as retail and hospitality, tourism, human services, creative arts and education. But despite this, the leaders are making male-dominated industries the focus of their campaigns. While there are some exceptions, they're not generating significant attention on the campaign trail. Both major parties need women's votes to claim victory. The latest Roy Morgan poll for Queensland shows that women favour the ALP 53.5% over LNP 46.5% on a two-party preferred basis. Women's perspectives may not be dominating the campaign, but they will be crucial when it comes to the result. Regardless of the election outcome, we can be sure that without either leader stepping up more strongly for women and being supported by their parties to do so, this election will also be a historic lost opportunity. So in this incredibly tight election, there's a lot of discussion about a hung parliament. Uh, should there be a hung parliament in Queensland? If it's the ALP, they might form government with the Greens. If it's the LNP, they might form government with the Cata Party as the two most likely options. So if that happens, what are these parties going to want? I'm going to come to Jenny first. What will the Greens want? What will the Cater Party want? Are there any other um, entities we should be looking at in terms of a hung parliament? Uh, the Cater Party actually have a very clear agenda. It's up on their website. Um, and, it's a, and, and it's a long tradition in Queensland. So it's, it's 
they want to get rid of a lot of the regulation that annoys them that comes from Queensland. So it's a, a, a thinking about being able to develop um, untravelled. So whether it's resources or agriculture or whatever. So there's a whole lot of stuff that flows off from that. Um, they want uh, guns uh, deregulated to a certain extent, particularly for farmers. Um, it's a bit of agrarian socialism. They want a rural development bank to help agriculture. They're interested in um, North Queensland seceding from the southern states. Um, so they will have a clear agenda about wanting that kind of stuff from the, from the LNP and they will find some sympathy with some areas of it there. Um, the Greens, their, their thinking is not as specific and because it's more of a democratically based party, I think there will be a lot of behind the scenes uh, consultation with membership of the Greens about what they would take to discussions with the um, ALP, but things like coal and resources and Adani would be in that mix. Yes, you're seeing that in the ACT, aren't you? This kind of very democratic grassroots, now we've got six seats, what do we want to do? It's not like any other party in that sense. Um, so coming to you, Tracy, what do you think? Hung Parliament, how would it work? Oh, look, there's would always talk about the Hung Parliament and it producing chaos, etc. I actually personally think that in a state like Queensland, I mean, we've had we've had minority governments before. They've worked quite well. We've got the example of the Gillard government, and whether you liked what she did or not, she certainly was productive. You know, Parliament continued to work, policies continued to be developed. So, you know, all the stuff that the parties put out about hung parliaments being a problem. I don't actually concur with. And I think in a state like Queensland, where you've got a unicameral system, where you've got a committee system that works OK at best some of the time. Um, having, the ne having to actually negotiate with others might actually be really good in terms of policy development. Um, it depends, though, on how pragmatic and realistic the Catters Australia Party are or the Greens are, on the other hand, and how willing they are to compromise, because as we know, governing is all about compromise. No one can get everything they want. So I think that's going to be the challenge. Those negotiations are certainly going to be interesting and probably tense. But I don't think a hung parliament is, ne is necessarily a complete disaster for Queensland. Mm, that's, that's very interesting. It certainly hasn't been for the ACT or other jurisdictions where, you know, voter satisfaction is very high. So what do you think, Paul? Do you think this uh, hung parliament would be disastrous rhetoric is, is justified for Queensland? Well, it's certainly on the cards. As Tracy said, we've had them before. We, you know, Queensland went from 1915 to 1995 without a hung parliament. That's 80 years. And since then, we've had three and we could be having a fourth. So that's just an indicative of the volatility in Queensland politics. Um, it doesn't have to be a bad parliament. I mean, the the, um, the uh, respected commentator, Noel Preston, wrote a very good paper about how the 90, uh, uh, the, between 95 and 98, that was some of Queensland's best uh, parliamentary performances because it was a knife edge parliament under the Borbidge government. Um, it, in terms of demands, um, you know, I think you know whether it's CASA trying to form with LNP or, or uh, Labor or Greens trying to form with Labor, I think the first demand or request will be a cabinet spot. Now, of course, that will be ruled out immediately because that reeks of deals. Um, so when these, when both the opposition leader and the premier say there are no deals, what they really mean is that there'll be no cap, there will be no coalition. There will be no cabinet spots. But, of course, there's going to be a deal in terms of confidence and supply. Um, so the Greens, are in, again, it's going to be very problematic, given that the, the, the Labor Party has recommitted itself to coal. That's going to be a major stumbling block for the Greens. If the Greens say you have to, to, you have to deny stage three of the Ackland mine near Toowoomba, the, the Labor government's going to balk at that because they know that's going to cost them the election in 2024. Um, and they and and if they're working with the Catter Party. The Catter Party will say, if, if, if Labor's in position to form minority government, the Catter Party will say, wind back the Vegetation Management Act. And again, that's not negotiable for Labor. Um, similar, but if but the Catters obviously will easily uh, form a, a relationship with the LNP. The LNP would easily say, yes, we can wind back the, the green tape, as it were, in regional Queensland. Um, but again, it's contingent on. What flavour the Labor Party brings to the negotiating table with either the Catters or the Greens is, is again, uh, contingent on the proportion of, of the left faction and the seats that they win. Um, you know, it was just by happenstance that the Greens won nearly 50% of the Parliament seats, uh, corporate seats in 2015 and again in 2017, and therefore became made it a left-wing government. 
Should the AWU return to its position of dominance that we've seen since 1989, but before 2015, you'll see a much more economically focused, pragmatic government that would, it may well do things like um, modify environmental protection or, uh, and, and, um, and, and perhaps uh, issues around mining. We just don't know. Oh, thank you. That's, that's a lot to think about for whoever the incoming government is. So I'm coming to last thoughts from our panel now, and we're thinking about, even though we're obsessed with Queensland politics, we all have to agree it's been a little bit dull, uh, this campaign, and it shouldn't have been. It should have been historic for many reasons. During COVID, fixed-term election, everything to play for, uh, federal implications, female leaders for the first time, should have been epic, was kind of a little dull. What's going on and what are the implications for the federal election? I'm going to come to you first, Paul. Well, I did think it was dull. It was the dullest one I can remember. But again, going back to the um, the idea that there's no appetite for change in the electorate, the Brisbane City Council election was extraordinarily dull. Um, I think this this is... Uh, obviously, it's, I think there's an air of sobriety, not just in politics, but, you know, everyone's quite sober. Everyone's quite austere. Uh, everyone's very serious. Um, and I don't, and I think the parties were aware of that. So they didn't want a lot of razzle dazzle. Um, they knew to keep it serious. They knew to keep it austere. Um, and also on top of that, you've got the lack of federal intervention. We didn't have the federal league. We had one Scott Morrison visit and I've never seen a federal leader enter a state campaign and then depart and leave so little trace. Uh, mm. there was almost like he was never here. Uh, and similarly, we had no federal labor, uh, uh members coming. Uh, compare that to the 2019 election where you had, for example, Bob Brown and the Greens convoy, you know, that sort of colour and movement. Um, so the COVID environment where everyone was feeling sober and austere, the lack of federal intervention uh, and just the fact that it, it's, it was um, designed, I think, Labor designed their campaign to be rather um, no frills because they know that uh, no frills campaigns um, in a time of crisis or a big ticket uh, campaign, big ticket election, does favour incumbents. And we've seen that reflected in the Northern Territory, the Australian Capital Territory and New Zealand. So I think that was, again, partly happenstance, but partly by design in Labor's case. I mean, I guess we should be grateful it was a civil election, no big gaffes. Um, but I feel like it, it could be austere, but it could still have a bit of inspiration. I guess I was looking for a little bit of inspiration because, you know, a lot of Queenslanders are facing the most hardship they've ever faced in their lifetimes. I expected to see a little bit of empathy for that um, from the candidates, which we really didn't get, I don't think. Um, and all the high vis and hard hats just sent me out of my mind, as you frequent viewers may have noticed. So uh, coming to you, Jenny, uh, what do you think? What, what are the implications for the federal election? And, you know, did it have to be this way? Um, I, I agree with Paul. I think that uh, boring and unevent uneventful does benefit the incumbent. So Anastasia Palaszczuk would have been quite happy with the way that it's rolled out because she's continued to be seen as a steady pair of hands all the way through this. Um, and, and, and with the kind of the vision and the big picture stuff, it's always a bit tricky for uh, state governments because their issues are really the bread and butter issues. So the, the, um, the crime stuff does get a bit of traction, health, got very little traction at all this campaign, which is interesting because we're in the middle of a pandemic in which the health system has done extraordinarily well. So it's hard to get above some of that. Um, from the federal government's point of view, I think that they would be incredibly heartened, kind of paradoxically, um, if Labor was re-elected because it shows that you can win, an incumbent government can win an election in a recession. And we haven't seen much evidence of that before. So Scott Morrison might actually think, OK, not too bad an outcome. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and what about you, Trace? Have you been bored or have you been fascinated? No, no, it's a little been a little bit dull, a little bit quiet, a little bit, you know, and like you, I'm completely over the, the high vis, completely over it. Um, I think the one lesson that, you know, if the feds were listening, and I'm not sure they ever do to, to, to states and what goes on in states, all that well, but it's impossible to treat Queensland as one entity. As Paul has written about, as Jenny has talked about, there are just so many lessons, you know, and how you how you have to um, 
you know, appeal to voters in the South East is very, very different to how you appeal to voters in regional Queensland, whether that be out west or whether that be up in North Queensland. So I don't think there's one particular lesson you can take away. But I think what has happened is that the management of the pandemic has really elevated the state governments in a way that we haven't seen for a really long time. And yeah. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I, th I think that's a heartening sign. And in 2020, Maybe it's good to be a little bit bored for a change. It hasn't been, you know, maybe that's nice. Uh, maybe what you want is a kind of a, at least this is working as normal kind of feeling. And when you look at what's happening in America, I mean, you know, we have to be grateful for an organised independent electoral commission that can kind of manage this sort of, you know, excessive numbers of people coming out early pre-poll, no chaos, no violence on the streets. I think, you know, the one thing to celebrate is, you know, our version of democracy, at least in terms of its electoral laws and things, work really well. And I think Australians need to be proud of that. I agree. Um, I, f I feel a deep sense of gratitude uh, to be in a kind of a place where we can go through a free and fair election in the in the watching the chaos of the US election. Absolutely. Uh, so a big shout out to the Electoral Commission of Queensland. May I thank our wonderful couch, Dr. Paul Williams, Dr. Tracy Arclay, Jenny Menzies. Uh, it has been a wonderful time to be spending with you. Thank you for watching Queensland Votes and may I urge you to go and exercise your democratic right to vote. Take your own pencil or pen and make sure you get one of those democracy sausages. See you later.